In this video we're going to look at modifying this drive spindle for the uh, tape drive on my HP 85B computer. If you've watched the previous videos then you'll know that the issue with this is that the uh, rubber drive roller was worn out so we replaced that. Um, but then the next issue we had was that the tapes themselves are unreliable and um, they have a habit of uh, chewing themselves up and uh, they degrade and you just can't use them. So the idea was to modify the drive to use DC2000 tapes but the tape is so uh, the tape housing is thicker, tape itself is wider and the drive wheel is about two millimeters or so higher up relative to the base plate. Other than that the uh, tapes are kind of interchangeable. And um, in this video I'll just briefly explain the method I'm going to use to modify this and then we'll look at uh, how to go about machining the parts that we need to achieve this. Um, in response to the previous video I had some interesting comments, some suggestions as to how you, you could go about doing this and um, some I'd already considered and we'll touch on why I discounted some of those um, ideas in this video. So before we start machining, I'll just briefly explain what I intend to do. And uh, one of the uh, first uh, suggestions that was made was to turn this between centers. And um, to be honest, turning between centers for something like this um, wouldn't really gain you anything. Uh, turning between centers does not automatically guarantee um, that the part is running true. You still have to uh, center the centers and then you don't really gain anything with this uh, type of machining. The only real advantage you get turning between centers is that you can take the part out and put it back in again without losing the, uh, the kind of center of the rotation setting. We'll look at that in more detail when we go into the workshop. Uh, and also there's not really enough space to get a, a dog of any sort on this and in uh, particular this very delicate encoder wheel is bonded to this part so I need to be very careful not to damage that and that's one of the main uh, limitations here if that wasn't bonded on uh, I'd actually machine an entire new part and that way uh, we wouldn't have to mess about modifying this one. Uh, so uh, the way I intend to mount this in the lathe is I'm going to make a spindle adapter and I'll machine that in position and then we can slide this onto it, use the grub screws to secure it and then this will spin true as it does on the motor spindle. And um, one other thing I want to try and uh, look at in this video is the way to do this with minimal tooling. I do have some fairly sophisticated tooling that would make this job very easy. I could even see and see it. Uh, but that wouldn't really help anybody so I don't think videos that just show how to use expensive equipment uh, are that um, helpful. It might be interesting but um, it's not really something that most people are going to be able to make use of. So I intend to use um, the absolute minimal of tooling to do this job and um, to that end uh, we'll make up um, adapters in the lathe, machine this in place without taking the adapter out to make sure it runs true uh, as I did with the, um, the, the pinch roll that I showed. Uh, if you do all the machining in one step without taking the part out of the lathe you can guarantee that uh, everything is concentric and it will run true. One other thing to bear in mind with this is the motor shaft itself is very long it actually goes pretty much to the top of this part. So another suggestion was to cut this and just replace the top part and keep the bottom part with its grub screws and make a similar part for the top with grub screws as well. Now I did initially consider that but uh, having looked at the part and how it would work I discounted it and there's a very good reason why I discounted that and why I don't think it will work. And this is important whenever you're doing something like this uh, see how the part that you are imagining is going to fit into the machine. So in this case the idea was to replace this top section where it had a wider uh, top part, extend this down 
and put grub screws very similar to the uh, bottom part. But this would then be in two parts, each part of which could then be secured to the motor shaft. The reason I discounted that is I want this machine to still be able to use the original tapes. And if you look at the tape, the drive wheel is actually recessed relative to the edge of the uh, base plate. So when you put this in the machine and you put the drive wheel up against the wheel in the tape, there's very little clearance between the edge of the plate and this section of the spindle. So you can't really make it any, any wider, any, any bigger, you can't increase the diameter uh, that you would need to do to put uh, grub screws in because it would then foul on the tape itself. And because the walls are very thin, if we actually measure this, so a 3.2 millimeter bore, uh, so that's the size of the hole, and if we measure the outside of this, then it's 5.2. So it's only one millimeter wall thickness, and that's not enough to put a grub screw in. Uh, reliably, you could put one in there, but um, it wouldn't be reliable. It's aluminium, it would probably strip after you try and tighten it. So that's why I discounted that method. Uh, another method you could use, that I've seen done and does seem to work, is you could glue an extension onto this, machine it back flat, and then put your, um, your friction material on there, whatever you intend to use. And um, Again, I decided not to do that for two reasons. One is it's already been done. There are videos showing that, uh, so I didn't really want to duplicate that. Um, but also I wanted to um, have this kind of future-proofed, easier to repair in the future, where I don't have to repeat that process or necessarily even take this out of the machine if I need to replace the uh, drive wheel again. So the uh, solution I went for uh, was to actually decide to machine this top section down so that I could fit a pinch roller. And what I'll be doing here is machining this top section down and it's only reducing the diameter by about 0.2 millimeters. So in other words, this diameter would continue pretty much to the top with a very slight step starting uh, at this point just below the existing wider section uh, and then the new roller will just sit on there uh, be a press fit not too tight there's the press fit on there and it will hold itself in place and um, the thickness of this when we measured this this uh, is the tape we want to use this is the position this normally sits in and when it was in the machine the top of this section was sitting just underneath the drive uh, wheel that we want to actually uh, press up against and that is 2.5 millimeters uh, high so in other words we need to make our new uh, section 2.5 millimeters taller but starting at the same point and so I've already made the pinch roller I intend to use and it's the correct size so that will sit in this relative location and all I'll need to do now is machine this down so that this top section is the right diameter for our bore in our pinch roller. There's a few reasons that I wanted to take this uh, approach. One is because it gives me a lot more control over the final product and for example if I decide I want something that's slightly softer I can use a smaller uh, core uh, or former and keep uh, more rubber, so I'd have a, th a thicker rubber section. Uh, the size I ended up with for this was the same diameter that uh, we used for the um, original uh, repair of the roller, and the width of this is 6.6 .6 millimeters, and that gives us the correct height and will work for both types of tape. Uh, when we come to machining things like this, um, this is where you can get unstuck and what I want to really focus on with this video is it's very easy to machine things like this and end up with something that looks very nice but if you're not careful especially when you have two separate parts that you've machined separately it can run off center and if this runs off center it will make a lot of vibration a lot of noise 
and may not uh, work properly, could even damage the tapes or the machine. So there are various ways to get uh, around that. Uh, one is you could machine this, put it on your adapter, fit this onto it, and then machine the rubber afterwards. Uh, the only problem doing that is when you, if, or if ever you take this off, uh, you'd kind of lose the uh, correlation between the roller and the drive. So you'd have to repeat the entire process and replace this. Uh, so the method I tend to use is to center everything. So I showed how to do that with this. It's all turned in one uh, operation and we'll do something similar with this part. So that's what we're going to do and uh, really the question is how to center parts in the lathe. If you're uh, familiar with uh, lathe work you'll know how to do all this. You probably won't find this very interesting. Uh, but we'll go over to the workshop now and we'll look at various ways that you can center a part and uh, get it to run true. Now the lathe I'm going to be using is kind of way too big for this operation. As you probably know I do have smaller lathes but they're very difficult to film around because I can't get the camera in and um, actually use a lathe at the same time. So we use a larger lathe but uh, you can still use big lathes for this operation it's just a bit overkill uh, but the techniques are the same. Uh, so we'll get over to the workshop, get started on this. As I say, I've already made the pinch roller. If uh, you want to know how I made this, go back and look at a previous video that I posted recently and I show how I go about making uh, pinch rollers like this. So we now need to start work on the drive spindle itself. So before we start any machining, we'll just address one of the main issues that you'll come across if you're not familiar with uh, lathe work. And um, it's something that can be a major problem if you make parts separately. So if you turn parts that then you fit together and um, if you haven't taken certain things into account, you'll find that they don't run true. And it can be a bit uh, confusing as to why that is the case until you become very familiar with the issues that you'll get when using lathes. So the first thing is uh, typically you'll have a chuck like this. This is just a uh, three jaw, jaw chuck. When you uh, tighten the chuck jaws, all three jaws move at the same time, close in and group the part. And um, one of the issues with these is the part that you clamp in very rarely runs centrally. And what I mean by that is it, it kind of runs in an orbit because the chuck is not perfectly manufactured. You can grind chuck jaws to try and make them more accurate. The problem doing that is there's a, a kind of a spiral gear inside the chuck and that's responsible for moving the chuck jaws in and out as you turn the tightening keys. And because that's not perfectly manufactured if you grind the jaws, for example, to grip a 50 millimeter part very accurately, if you then change the jaws, wind them in to grip a part that's 25 millimeters, you might find it's then running off center again. Uh, so uh, either way, it's almost impossible to get a three jaw chuck to run uh, accurately all the time. You can get uh, chucks with adjustable jaws, you can use a four jaw chuck, uh, in which case the jaws are normally independently driven. So you can use a dial gauge or something similar and uh, basically adjust your part so it is running true. And um, it's a bit of a pain and um, having to do that every time you take the part out uh, is a real pain. So usually it's easier to machine everything in place. So just to back up what I'm saying, what I've got set up here is a piece of accurately ground uh, tall steel. We've got a dial gauge and I've got this set up so that if I bring the dial gauge towards the part you'll notice the, oh, hopefully you can see the uh, gauge moving and you notice that as the uh, ball on the end of the probe moves up the round section of the material then the reading goes around clockwise and then when we get over the center, it'll start going down again. And also the ball's going down the other side. So if I put it on the peak, 
which is about there and then we wind the travel back and forward you can see that it's not really moving there's a few little bumps here and there it's just the inaccuracies in the surface of the material um, this um, dial gauge uh, the increments are 0.01 millimeters so it's shown as uh, kind of a zoomed in um, uh, error if you like of the part so if we now rotate the chuck, just take it out of gear, so if we now rotate the chuck, notice that the dial gauge is moving over quite a significant distance. That's not because the part is bent, uh, otherwise if it was bent we'd get different effects depending on where along its length we put the gauge. But it's the same wherever I put it, and that's because the part is not running centrally it's been uh, it's only a few um, hundredths of a millimeter but that's enough when you make up parts like we're going to machine here to make the part run off center and for it to be really non-functional uh, and cause you a lot of problems what we can do is machine the part in one step and we'll just demonstrate why machining in one step can be important so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a piece of brass into the chuck. I'm going to turn the end down, the end uh, maybe 10 millimeters, and we'll use the dial gauge to check that it's concentric and it's running true, or at least the part that we've machined is running true. What I'll then do is take it out of the chuck, put it back in, and we'll see what happens. So I've machined a little bit of the end of this um, piece of brass. We'll now bring the dial gauge back in, find the peak which is there. If I now rotate the chuck, notice the dial gauge is not moving at all, it's absolutely perfectly centered. We'll now take the part out of the chuck, far enough, we'll put it back pretty much where it was bring the dial gauge back in back on the peak which is there rotate the chuck and now notice it's way off center you can mess about, you can rotate this, try and get it back exactly where you want it, you can mark it before you take it out. It generally won't really help that much, it might help a little bit, but it will still run off centre when you put it back in. So the general rule is, once you take this out, then all bets are off as far as it running true if you put it back in again. So we'll just go over to the uh, workbench, have a look at some of the alternatives uh, that we can use as opposed to necessarily having to machine something all in one go because that's not always uh, convenient or even possible. So one solution is to use collet holders so you can use something like this put it into your four jaw chuck and uh, very carefully center it so what you would do is you would put a collet in put a piece of ground material in that's accurate use your dial gauge get it centered so that it's running absolutely true. And what you can then do is use collets. And um, in theory, that means every time you put a part in there, because the collets are very accurately ground, you'll be very close to center. And that's quite a good solution. It's not quite as accurate as turning everything in one step, um, but it is a very good alternative. Uh, these are quite expensive, collets aren't particularly expensive but it all adds up so if you don't have that uh, as an option what you can do is turn between centres um, turning between centres really is you'll put a centre like this into the chuck you'll have another one in your tail stock and then in the part itself you'll machine um, a kind of recess or dimple into each end of the part and then it sits between these. Problem is, of course, that when the chuck spins, it's not really driving the part. So you'll use something called a dog, and that's something you slip over the part, it clamps onto the part, and then there's a kind of uh, offset finger that normally 
uh, is uh, is driven round by one of the jaws of the chuck. Um, problem with that, of course, is it means you uh, lose access to certain parts of the part. Okay, so this is what a dog looks like, and um, this um, is a dog part. This here, and this would be clamped onto the part. This arm or this finger extends engages with one of the jaws on the chuck and is driven round. That's what drives the part around. And then the part itself just rotates between the centres, although the centre in the headstock is of course rotating, which is why it needs to be centred. And um, the advantage in doing this is because once you've got everything centred, you can take the part out, do what you like with it, put it back in, and it should still be very close to centre unlike um, if you put the part directly in the chuck because you haven't removed the centre, in theory at least, from the chuck. The easiest way I've found to get these on centre and the method I normally use because it's actually fairly quick is I'll keep some uh, hex bar around like this and I'll put this in the chuck, just touch up the uh, taper on it and so I'll just set my uh, compound on the uh, lathe machine this, initially it will run off centre slightly of course, but once you've machined it, it's running perfectly true, uh, and then you can use that as your centre. And on the tailstock end, you use another centre, maybe a life centre, and uh, the life centre's just got a, some uh, bearings in here, and it reduces the friction, so this part turns with the part, and it uh, avoids uh, rubbing the part and, and heating up where this presses into the part if this is fixed. Um, it works fairly well, again, it's just extra cost. You can also use something like this um, at the tailstock end, so again a collet holder, and um, there are many different options you can have. When it comes to smaller parts, as I've said before, I make clocks, I use um, this method of turning between centres quite extensively, but quite often I have to make up a custom dog, so something like this, and this clamps onto the part, and is driven around, that's why this is the wrong way around by the way. Um, so this would be in the um, chuck, the part would be sitting here, this is clamped onto the part, and then this is used to drive the part around. So you can make these in whatever flavour you want, and it is a method, um, and it's quite useful if you're turning a, a complex part or one that you're going to need to take out, maybe to uh, test fit or to measure, it's quite a good technique to use. It's not really suitable for this part, it, the, this part's too small and it doesn't really gain us anything because uh, we'd still have to centre the part anyway. So the method I'm going to use is to make up uh, a fitment, so that's something, we'll put some material into the chuck jaws. I'll turn that to the correct size, so in this case I'm going to put in a piece of um, silver steel into the chuck, it'll run off centre initially, but I'm going to turn that down, at least the end of it down, so it's the correct diameter for this to be a close sliding fit. So 3.14 millimeters, and then once I've done that, I can slide this on, tighten the grub screws, and then this will run very true because it's running on a part with machined in place. So I'll get that done. I won't show you the machining that. I'm just gonna put a piece of tool steel into the chuck, turn it to the correct diameter, uh, and then we can fit our part and begin machining it. I've put a piece of 5mm diameter silver steel in the chuck. I've turned that down to 3.16mm. The motor shaft is actually 3.14mm, but this is, uh, or well, the, the, the spindle's quite a, a loose sliding fit on it, so I've made this very slightly bigger to make sure that the spindle is properly centred. I don't want it being pushed off uh, centre by the grub screws. The more accurate we can get this now, the better the final result will be. So I've turned that down to diameter and um, I've got the dial gauge set up and uh, same as before, we've got it set to the peak of the position. So that's now on the peak of the material. And if I rotate the chuck, you can see because it's been turned in place, we have pretty much zero run out on it. So what I can do now is fit the uh, actual part onto that. So assuming I've made it the right size, we can take our component, and this should now slide quite snugly onto there, which it does. We'll get it right to the end, 
So the um, the spindle's uh, all the way on now, it's supported all the way along. And uh, what we could do if we wanted to is leave this slightly proud, put a centre in this end, and um, it would make sure that it doesn't sort of flap about when we're trying to turn it. One thing I didn't mention earlier when I, when I was talking about turning between centres is that you need to be fairly certain that your tailstock is properly aligned with your headstock, otherwise you end up machining a taper into the part. That might be what you want of course, um, but in this case we don't, we want it to be a parallel fit. One option here incidentally would be to use a taper on the end of this to fit the uh, wheel onto. You'd have to cut a taper in the wheel of course, but it would be a very good method of mounting it. In this case I'm going to just put a straight shoulder on here, uh, machine this down to the uh, diameter to suit our new uh, wheel and uh, that will be this part done. So I'm just going to tighten the grub screws so this will turn when the chuck spins and uh, we can start machining. I'm going to start by machining the bulk of this off using a button cutter. Uh, we'll then position uh, our finishing cutter. I'm actually going to use a parting tool to do this and uh, the reason for that is I don't want to put too much force on this. If that doesn't work well, what I can do is put a, a very sharp uh, precision ground tool in here. Uh, but as I said, I'm trying to use standard uh, tooling here. So I'm just going to try a parting tool. Uh, but I'll begin by getting rid of the bulk of the material using the button insert cutter. What I'm going to do now is change tools to the tool I intend to take this to final diameter with, to make a very light pass, measure the diameter and then finish off the cut by taking this to the final size that I want. Unfortunately I'll have to move the camera out of the way because I've only got one shot at this and I don't want to destroy the part, um, but it's just really continuing with what we've been doing, uh, albeit with a slightly different tool. So I'll get you back once I've finished machining this uh, small step. I'm just taking this down to the right size for our new wheel and keeping the depth of that cut the same as the, uh, the width of the original uh, drive part of the spindle. Okay, so I've turned this to a diameter of 5.01 millimeters which should be a nice fit for our wheel, which it is. I'm going to put a small amount of Loctite on there just to hold it in place, stop it working its way off and then push it the rest of the way on. I don't want to put it on until I've got the Loctite on because it will be quite a tight fit. And uh, we can then try and spin it and see how it looks. I've got the wheel Loctited onto the spindle and if I want to replace this, I can just heat the end very gently with a soldering iron to loosen the Loctite, slide off the wheel, put a replacement on, and um, this, it just makes it very uh, future-proof. It means if I ever want to replace the wheel or if it wears out, it would be much easier to replace it. If I bring the dial gauge in, I've got it set up. So we'll bring that in, rotate the chuck. It's running on rubber, of course. It will move about a little bit, but you can see very well centered and what I'll do is just run up the lathe and you'll be able to see it spinning So as you can see it's running very true, no sign of any runout on it. We can't measure more than about one hundredth of a millimetre runout, so it's looking good. The length is correct, I have measured it, it's all sat in the right place. So we can now go back into the workshop and uh, get this reassembled. So that's our part finished, 
and it seems to have worked out fairly well so far. If we put it up against the DC2000 tape, it seems to work fairly well. It's not fouling anything, it's not uh, rubbing on the tape, and it also still seems to fit with the original tape. So should drive both types of tape. It's nice and concentric, should spin quite uh, centrally. Uh, somebody asked about the encoder disc. Could I do a close-up of um, what the uh, actual surface looks like? So it looks like this. As you can see, very fine series of lines, and uh, that's obviously why uh, I don't want to mess this up. Uh, don't fancy my chances of being able to make a working replacement. And uh, this can now go back together, but uh, this video is getting quite long, so I'll wait and put that off until the next video. But the next step is to reassemble all this. I need to make an electronic uh, change to the uh, actual tape transport mechanism. One of the uh, resistor values needs changing to take into account the different uh, magnetic media. Um, but that's a fairly easy change and we'll do that in the next video.